This is an ABC podcast. It's not just human life and property that the bushfires destroy. There has been an almost unimaginable toll on wildlife. We're looking at the deaths of more than a billion animals, and that's a conservative estimate. I'm Stephen Stockwell. And I'm Angela Lapierre. And today on The Signal, the 100-year journey home for Australian wildlife. I've got a wombat in front of me, uh, a little girl who came from the fire grounds. What's, what's she been through? I'd imagine a lot. She was found in the middle of the road and she was picked up by a member of the public without a struggle, without anything, just easily picked up and brought into care and she just smelt of death, the poor thing. Um, and we think it's all burnt airways and that, but with burns and that, it can take days for it to to show up. So smoke inhalation burns, we don't know. And what's her name? Wanda, the wandering wombat from Wandandian. I mean, that's an adorable name by any standard, but not even alliteration can take the edge of that kind of misery. Um where were you? Uh, that was at Sydney Wildlife Rescue, about 40 minutes north of the city. Mm-hmm. And Wanda was in Joan Reed's arms. So Joan's the founder of that group. And she was kind of holding her like a child and feeding her formula from a bottle. Right, along with a whole lot of other injured animals, I'm betting. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a few around. I just want to explain where we are first. Mm-hmm. This is our um, uh, rehabilitation facility for Sydney Wildlife Rescue. <coughs> Sorry. Um, it's the smoke from being down at the fires. It's upset my throat. Um, yeah, so what we've got here is uh, big areas that once we've hand-raised the animals in our homes, um, my backyard wasn't big enough for macropods, so I decided I needed somewhere bigger that they could build up their muscle strength, get uh, dehumanised and get ready to go back into the wild. What, what animals have you got in here at the moment? Oh, sorry. Uh, we have kangaroos that have come up um, from uh, one of our members mainly. Uh, Her house was um, hit by the fires, so all her enclosures were burnt. House was all right, thank goodness. So she had to send up her animals up to here. So we've got eastern grey kangaroos from her place. We've got a wombat. We've got a tawny frogmouth that had smoke inhalation. Possums. We'll see as we go, hey? Okay, so it's like a big space where all these animals can run around, I guess. Yeah, if you've ever watched Skippy the Bush Kangaroo, this is actually the wildlife park that that was filmed in. Really? Yeah, I know. It's actually been abandoned for a while. It's really overgrown now, and they use it to wean these animals off human support. Although there was this little kangaroo called Georgie that kept following Joan and I around. That one's one of the newer ones, and we've got two that are hard to tell apart, so we put little collars on them. That one's just come up here. So it's still quite friendly. So as Joan was saying, she's been to the fire grounds. Sydney Wildlife Rescue were actually in the middle of fitting out a mobile vet clinic in a motorhome when they got a call that a rescue group on the south coast needed help. The day we left, because it was our first trip in this, it'll make me cry again. We got down to Terry Hills and we had two horses in front of us and four RFS fireys walking us down the street and we all, all the people in the van just burst into tears. It was just so nice. And then a lot of people, you know, Sydney Wildlife members and members of the public that have been involved, all waving and cheering. And look, I'm getting all teary again and I shouldn't. But it was just such a special moment that for the RFS to be, you know, looking after us. Yeah, we should be looking after them. They've done just so much for so long, and yet they had they made the time to come and see us go. It was yeah, it was pretty special. So Joan and her team start this three-hour drive to Wandandian, which is just past Nowra on New South Wales south coast. Uh, it's just burnt. Like you, we're thinking, oh, this is all right, you know, and then all of a sudden you just hit black and there's nothing under the trees and it's just devastating. Just, just, you just want to cry seeing burnt buildings, burnt 
ground. Uh, we didn't see animals as we were driving along, but when we uh, were stationed at Adrena's and that people, because she had let people know in the area if they had animals that needed to come in to bring them in. So we saw kangaroos, echidnas, wombats, snakes. Uh, I think there was a lot of um, kangaroos with burnt feet, obviously, you know, sad. What sort of injuries did you, did you see on the animals? So the kangaroos had the burnt feet. What, what else were they coming to you with? Um, the burns were probably the main thing, but smoke inhalation. Uh, the little wombat that I've got that came up from down there, it um, smells like its, it's uh, airways have been slightly burnt um, or the smoke, it, it's just got this horrible smell coming from its mouth, um, a dead sort of smell. And do you have much of an idea of how many animals have been, been injured in these fires at all? No idea. There'd be a hell of a lot, but no idea. It's just like, awful. So the animals that have been really badly affected by these fires, you know, in, in the kind of most serious cases, where do they tend to go next? Um, it depends what you mean by most serious cases, but the ones that are going to be hand raised uh, come home to people's houses, whether it's down there or up here, um, and they get hand raised because, you know, you just need to look after them um, and care for them. After that, once they've been hand raised, if they do survive and everything goes well, then they will go to somewhere like a rehab facility and then from there they get released back to where they came from. At what point would they come here? Um, it depends on the species, but they all have to be self-sufficient as in eating and drinking by themselves. Um, the wallabies and wombats, we tend to get up here a little bit earlier than like birds or other animals, um, simply because they have a longer time and if we can get them up here um, fairly early when they're just lapping one bowl a day, because um, we only come up here once a day to feed and clean, but it's a dehumanising, so we don't want to be here all the time looking after them. Or, you know, we come up if we have to, but we don't want to be cuddling them or trying to get them to drink and things like that. So, yeah, they come up and they'll be on one bowl a day just to, so they'll settle in and still use their pouches. It makes it easier on them. Um, birds, obviously, they can come at any time. Kangaroos, we get at any time, and wallabies because they're injured, but... If we're doing it from home, that's when we'll bring them up. Yeah. How long until you know, the animals that you've got here that have been affected by the bushfires can be released back into the wild? Oh, it could be six months or more. You know, you've got to realise that the food has to have grown. We have to have had rain. There needs to be grass and fresh browse on the trees, you know, fresh leaves and things, flowers for bats uh, you know, and, and possums. The lizards have to have insects, all that takes time, and the echidnas have to have termites. Well, if everything's been burnt and there's no rain, it takes a long time for all that to happen. It's no use releasing something if there's no food for it or water. So it's not so much a matter of, you know, them getting better, it's a matter of them having, I guess, a home to go back to. Yeah, it's both actually. They've got a, you know, when they come in early, yes, it's a matter of them getting better. But when they're up here, it's a matter of them having a home, as you say, to go back to that is a suitable home to go back to with food and water. And what do their homes look like at the moment? Just burnt. Just burnt. There's nothing underneath the trees. To the best of our knowledge, how many animals have been killed during this summer's bushfires? The, the estimates really start at over a billion. And the reason for saying start there is that the, the estimate of a billion animals or just over comprises well, extrapolations from average density figures that we have for mammals, birds and reptiles in New South Wales and adding Victoria in as well. 
But of course, much more habitat is burned in South Australia, Queensland, uh, Western Australia. And when you start to add in the as yet unknown numbers of animals that may have been affected in those states, the numbers will be much higher. This is Chris Dickman. He's a professor in ecology at Sydney University. And while you've probably heard that number thrown around a bit, Chris is the guy who actually worked it out. Okay, so a billion sounds like an like we, we you almost can't really imagine what a billion means. But I, I guess I wanted to try and put it in context of the overall um, populations of these animals that we're talking about. So I mean, what what kind of percentage? I imagine it it varies across different species. For the koala, for example, we we don't there's not a not a huge amount of the of koala habitat that's been burned in comparison with other species. We know that thirty percent of the koala habitat has burned in northern New South Wales, and as a consequence, probably thirty percent of the koala population there will have will have died. <clears throat> but for other species, as much as ninety or a hundred percent of their habitat has burned. And for them, particularly if they're threatened in the first place, we're probably looking at um, pretty dire consequences. Extinctions are a really very possible and very likely result for many of these. Yeah. So, so which animals are, I, I was unaware of, of that kind of, that there were species that had lost a hundred percent of their habitat. Do we know which species there are, how many are in that position? Um, and how long will it be before we can tell whether or not they are in fact extinct as a result of these fires? Yeah. So some of the, um, the ones that we, we know least about are probably the most affected, which sounds a little bit odd, but it, um, it will cover a lot of the narrow range endemic invertebrates, species that, um, we know are out there. They haven't necessarily been properly discussed. And fires will have uh, will have knocked out all of many of their populations. Um, one recent estimate has put it that as many as 700 species of insects may have become extinct because their entire ranges were were encompassed by the fire. With the vertebrates, we're looking at um, species like the long-footed potteroo. It looks as if much of its range, probably 75-80%, has been burned by the fires. It's a species that really likes tall, moist, dense forests with a lot of understory. And if that's removed, it's really not very good for the, for the potteroo. It doesn't like that sort of habitat and it gets eaten by predators. So it's more or less a guarantee that some species have gone extinct in this process? I think we can say that, yes. I've got to confess, I don't actually know what a potteroo is. It sounds adorable. Could you just humour me and describe a potteroo? Yes, um, they are absolutely adorable. They, they're they about the size of a, of a bandicoot, can I say that? Um, yeah. Rabbit, maybe. Okay. Um, but they're, um, they're compact little animals with a pointy snout. They're members of the rat kangaroo family. So they... Um, if you can imagine a, a very squat kangaroo with uh, with much shorter hind legs, and uh, they run about on the on the forest floor looking for fungi to eat, oh. and they're very important from a from that point of view. Uh, they're fungal specialists, and the fungi they eat assist with the growth of um, of trees and shrubs and other green plants, and uh, and so assist in uh, in forest regeneration, forest regrowth. Are they shy or are they feisty? Like, what's the character of a potteroo? They're actually very shy. They're you can have um, numbers of these animals in an area wow. and be unaware that they're there. They tend to occupy dense vegetation. So unless you go really looking for them specifically or putting out cameras, you often don't realise they're there. Oh, I'm, I'm glad but also sad that I asked and now I know more about the potteroo. So the government has so far committed $50 million to uh, this problem, to the wildlife recovery task. Is that enough? I think it's a great start and it'll help to, I guess, look after the animals that have come into care, the injured animals, the singed animals that have been brought in by the, by the firefighters and people at the front. Probably for the longer term, we'll need a lot more. So the estimates of um, of a billion animals that um, that have been killed by the fires they they are really estimates that have been derived from average density estimates, and one of the reasons we've had to use that approach is that there is really quite a limited amount of monitoring in the areas that have been burned, where we know exactly what was there before, to be able to compare with what we find is there afterwards. So really, we need. I think a lot of uh, a lot of funding for long-term monitoring in in all of these environments. 
will these areas and you know will the the wildlife populations that existed in these places ever get back to what they were before the fires? Oh, there's, yeah, there's no doubt that some will, and it'll be the the more generalist species that don't have particular resource requirements or stringent resource requirements that come back first. So typically, in a uh, after a fire, but t- provided there are some unburned refuges where animals can move in from, as soon as there's a, a little bit more ground cover, when um, and the forest itself is is beginning to regrow, the trees are beginning to uh, to resprout, you'll get uh, the insectivorous marsupials like dunnarts and antichinus is moving in. I think you'll get um, some of the native rodents like bush rats, um, bandicoots will do well. So it'll, it'll happen, um, and within a couple of years we'll begin to see the front end of the recovery for both the, the plant and the animal populations in, in many burnt areas. Of course, where species have gone extinct, or for the specialists, um, it'll be a different, much slower recovery. OK, so if two years is the front end, then what's the back end? It may be 100 years before some areas are suitable again for, um, for things like parrots or greater gliders that, that require tree hollows. If these were in areas that have been badly burned, it's, it's decades, 100 years, before um, those key resources will come back. That's it for today's episode of The Signal. Uh, if you want to listen back to any of the episodes that we've done this year, we've been recapping a lot of the big stories that kind of happened over the summer. You can check them out on your favourite podcast app. And we'll be back in your feed tomorrow. I'll catch you then. Bye. See ya. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.